Hello everyone and welcome to the hacking case walkthrough. There are actually already a few walkthroughs on this out there, but I decided to go ahead and make this one, both because I'd already done a lot of the work and because they just kind of give you the answers. They don't really tell you about the artifacts, why it is you're there, what the registry is, and how to use autopsy. So. Uh, I've also given you a few resources. If you look at my notes, at the very least, I'd recommend checking out those 13 cubed videos. Those will tell you all about the different artifacts. And uh, that SANS poster is at least a quick little handy device too. Although, ultimately, you'll probably want to read some books on this, and I've got those as well. So, the first thing we need to do is get the image itself. Getting the image is going to work pretty much the same as last time, and if you were with me for that one, then you know that clicking directly on these links to the image just gets you a whole bunch of random characters, and that's because you're actually seeing the raw image interpreted through HTML, which is not going to work. So what we actually need to do here is pull up PowerShell or anything else that can give us a script. And if you recall last time we did this invoke web request, but this time we've got more than one image to get, so we might as well make the script repeat itself because we're gonna keep on doing this in the later walkthroughs as well. So what I've done here is I've just set a little variable, given it the number one, and that's at the end here. You remember our file type is EO1, EO2, etc. So I put it after the .eo here, and that's going to change. It's going to go up one every time that this section of script within these parentheses runs. And it's going to do that while the number is less than five or two or whatever you put there. We've got two images to download, so less than three means it's going to do it twice. Run that, and it's going to output it to a file wherever you want it to go right here. So now we've got it downloaded and we're ready to start the autopsy portion of this walkthrough. So let's open up autopsy, download it if you don't have it. It's pretty simple to get your hands on. And it's going to require you to put in a little bit of information here. After a few minutes, autopsy will finally get open, and you'll see that it operates on cases like this. So you have to start a new case in order to continue. You have to give it a name as well, because that's going to be the name of the directory that it sits in. So we'll just call it hack. As far as base directory, just choose wherever you'd like it to be within your folder structure and go with single user, unless you're some professional team and you're all working on this together. You don't have to give it a name or any of this optional information. Again, that's just for professionals to track it. And this is going to take a few minutes as well. Once that gets through with, it'll prompt you to select a data source. We just downloaded a disk image file, so take a while to guess what we'll be using. Then you're going to find that data source, which you just downloaded. So select that one, and now it is time to select a time zone. Now, interestingly enough, there's a question that asks what time zone this is in later, and it's not the one we select here to make this actually match the answers that they give for other timestamped questions. So select GMT minus 10, and your answers should match. These modules are how Autopsy makes sense of all of the data and gives it to you in a nice, visually pleasing way. Go ahead and select all. If you want to see what the different ones do, you can highlight them and it'll show you on the right here. You can even select different settings for some of them, but uh, the default settings should do just fine here. Go ahead and click Next. And while these modules will take a while, it's pretty much okay to select all because this is going to run in the background while you work, and it's going to continue to up continue to update you as it goes through both this little coin thing down here 
and this envelope up here that gives you more of a log of it. So just keep an eye on those as you go. So once that first bit of processing is done, you can go ahead and click finish here. You can see that it's running its modules in the bottom right bar here. And as it does that, we can talk about how autopsy itself is laid out. So much like FTK Imager when we ran through that last time, Autopsy has three windows. I'm going to go ahead and maximize this here. The first one is the tree window, and this first bit of it here works pretty much like you'd expect. Any data sources that you add show up here. Click the little plus and drop that down. You get the volumes that are on the disk here. Uh, NTFS is the file system that Windows uses, so volume 2 is definitely what we're going to be looking at most here, and it's pretty common to have some unallocated space before and after the Windows file system, so no reason to suspect anything odd is going on there. But if you drop that down, you'll just see that this is just the uh, C folder that Windows uses. So there is another tree down here called the Views tree, and this one lets you sort the files by other means than just how they're sorted in Windows or whatever operating system already. You can sort them by file types here, which gives you the options for both by extension and by MIME type. The reason for that, MIME type is more like what a file is actually encoded to be, whereas extension can easily be manipulated to obfuscate and hide things. So MIME type is going to be more accurate there. You can look at deleted files. Then you've got the results tree down here, and these are the results of the modules that are running. So you can see I've still got them running. This is going to populate more and more over time, but just off the cuff here, it found some web bookmarks that it can use. We'll come back to that a little bit more later. Next up, we've got the results viewer window over here, and whatever you've got highlighted in your data sources over here, it's going to be showing you what is underneath that in the next tree. Uh, same thing if you go down into results. What you can do over here is if you right click, and it's running a little slow right now because it's still running the modules, but we're halfway, so not bad you can add tags and this is going to be a little bit more of a professional thing as well but uh, these allow you to tag them for follow-up uh, you should have some other ones available that i'm not seeing for some reason right now but like I said, you're not really going to need those right now. It's just if you find evidence of child exploitation, of hacking, of anything else, it has those pre-made for you to tag with. And there they are, actually. It just looks a little different than it did on my earlier version that I was using. You can also add comments by saying tag and comment. And obviously, you still have to choose a tag there, but you can say whatever you want in here and it'll show up there, which brings us to these SCO columns, that is score, comments, and occurrences. Score can be notable or suspicious files. Uh, in this case, it's just showing you that it's been tagged as something, but normally what it does on its own is it'll find files by hash that are known to be suspicious or interesting, anything like that comments just shows you whether or not you've commented on it and occurrences shows you how many other times in your other cases that you've worked on this copy of autopsy you've seen this exact file so you'll know which ones are more common next up is the content viewer and the tabs that are available on this are going to vary by what it is you've got highlighted up here so if i go to this ini file it is probably going to give me some more options because it's not just a folder it actually has contents hex is going to be the raw data which hopefully you learned about in my last walkthrough if not shame on you 
Uh, and then if you go to text, it's just going to show you any available text that Autopsy is able to decode in here. It's got metadata. Uh, it's got annotations that are how that are on how it imported everything. The next thing I want to show you is both really obvious and really easy to miss. It actually has back and forward buttons up here. So just keep in mind wherever you go to, you can always just go right back to it, which is really nice to have when you accidentally click somewhere or don't remember where you found something. Next, I'll take a look at this timeline with you later on. And it looks like, there we go. I thought it crashed for a second. But uh, question number 26, we're going to get into a lot more detail with that. Just know that it takes all the timestamped files, all the events, everything that happened, puts it in a real nice timeline for you to work with. And uh, you can filter it out, look with more or less detail. It's really kind of the piece de resistance of autopsy over here. There's also an image gallery. We won't really be using that. Uh, as you might imagine, that's more for sexual exploitation types of cases. It'll automatically find known suspicious images uh, through hashes, and it just lets you browse them all in one place rather than having to go from one place to another. And finally, I'll show you how to extract a file here once it stops acting crazy. Okay, so if I wanted to extract a file, let's just come down to this INI file here. You just right click it, and it's still running a little bit slow here, but you just say extract files and choose a location. So that's a basic rundown on how to use autopsy. Now we're going to get into the actual case and questions themselves.